waiting for the wave to flash that up there if you think I'm deadpanning. There it goes. So welcome to the Park Forum. Uh, this, uh, today is Kurt Brown. He'll be talking about an open collaborative model, uh, the Intel Research Berkeley Experience. I know a lot of people here at Park have been watching. They're watching the, the development of a new kind of model between uh, uh, industry and a university and how, how that works to develop a new um, the collaboration for the science and so on. This is the fourth in a 11 part series of forums on invention and innovation. Um, next week is Paul Saffo. Uh, Paul's gonna be talking about the case of the blind Venetian. And I said, well that's a great title, what's that all about? And he, he, what he told me is that there's, a, there's a, an aversion toward risk taking in the valley. That um, we, we, th we think of Silicon Valley as, as going from success to success to success to success. He says it's not like that at all. The way it really works is it's failure to failure to failure to failure to success. And if we don't understand that, we won't get the model right. So that, that's what's coming up next week. Um, now, a little bit about Kurt Brown. He's co-director with Joseph Hellerstein of the uh, lab at Berkeley. <coughs> so his title is director, I guess he's gonna explain that. And Joseph's title is director, but they're, they're not co-directors. Um, his research interests are focused on information storage, retrieval, and analysis. He has a, a background in, in, in several places before, uh, before taking on this job. He was 13 years at IBM. Also created a startup company, which, uh, um, cute name here, 64K, obviously, with, uh, oh, never mind, I won't, I won't go there. So 64K uh, was, a, was a title. He got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin for work on what he's renaming now or other, other folks have renamed as autonomic uh, computing. Um, let me welcome Kurt. Thank you very much. Well, it's an honor to be here. And um, today, the talk I've got has about 40 minutes worth of material or slightly less. So um, I'm, I'm certainly encouraging interaction. Um, I do have title envy, though. I realize I have quite a boring title. Um, the talk that I sort of wanted to give um, was a sort of more dry academic talk, a comparison of these models with sort of lots of field work. Um, probably fortunately for you, I didn't have time to do the field work, and, and so I'm gonna give the more interesting talk, which is essentially a description of our experiment here and a sort of personal you know, view of its success to date. Um, so the talk is two halves. First half is I'm gonna start at the highest level, talk about Intel research, because we have to talk about where our lab fits in the Intel structure. So a little bit of management organization. Then I'm gonna dive into what we mean by the university lab. It's um, you know, uh, really a strong merging. As it, the goal was as strong a merge as possible between a, an industry and an academic research environment. And it's a sort of very interesting result. Um, so those are the three, first half of the talk would be that description. Um, and then the second half of the talk, um, the Berkeley lab is just over three years old. And so I figure it's time to sort of you know, do a little three years in assessment. So we'll talk about the general results, and then I'm gonna sort of illustrate two of our projects and what happened to them through the, uh, the most mature projects in the lab. Talk a little bit about how we transition directors in and out, because we have a sort of interesting rotating model of directors. Um, <laughs> although I'm not supposed to rotate, I suppose it all depends on my job performance. I'm still there though. Um, and then talk about you know, replicability of the model. How does this apply outside of Intel? Because I think Intel has some unique traditions. And again, please interrupt any time. So, um, Intel organization, this is sort of the standard corporate chart that just says it's a big company, it's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, this number here, 75 labs, 7,000 people, that's I think current count about 8% of the employees at Intel. Intel's a manufacturing company, so there's, there's, you know, that's I think the bulk of the employees. These labs and people are scattered around the various Intel divisions, product divisions. There's one uh, service division, sort of an overhead division, called Corporate Technology Group, which is headed by the Intel CEO, uh, CTO, sorry, Pat Gelsinger. Um, that's where our organization, Intel Research, fits in. He's probably got about, I don't know, one or 2,000 of these people, depending on how you count. His organization essentially is, uh, does what I call roadmap research, and that's essentially a market, a product, and a division already exist and is looking for the pipeline to go forward to the next generation, M plus one, M plus X. And so there has to be a research pipeline for that. So that's what I call roadmap driven research. And, um, and I'll sort of bring that theme, I'll, I'll return to that theme later. 
That's the majority of those 7,000 R&D people. If we zoom in then, specialize um, Intel Research, much smaller, um, headed by David Tenenhaus, who was an ex-DARPA, ex-MIT um, guy. Uh, that's about eight labs, or so this is like eight places where we have people in Intel Research. Um, and if you look at the places, Pittsburgh is the place to work because it's the only place you can have an, uh, an Intel Research meeting where you don't have to get up really early or stay up really late. So, so Pittsburgh is, that's, that's the one advantage of Pittsburgh. Um, no, I love, I love Pittsburgh. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Pittsburgh's great. It's just, it's a little isolated, you know, um, from, from the rest of Intel, which is more West Coast based. Um, the goal of T David's organization is essentially off the roadmap research. So um, it's, a, it's a, an organization that's only about four and a half years old, coinciding with when Tenant House joined. Intel did not have what you would call a sort of um, pure research organization before uh, they hired David. Um, they did mostly the roadmap research and certainly, you know, lots of advanced processor stuff and they certainly published, but they did not have sort of any off the roadmap organization. So the organization is fairly young. Uh, so the mechanisms are, some of them, are, some of these are fairly standard um, that we use in Intel research to sort of grow research that would hopefully benefit Intel. Um, the first is very common if we sort of go left or right along the research pipeline. Yeah. with your absorption of DEC, uh, the DEC research people? Um, actually, that, that, the alpha group, um, that was not part of research, actually. So those people went into what I call the roadmap lab, because they're obviously doing architecture and chip um, design. So that's sort of what I would call the roadmap. So we have actually a couple DEC people. Actually, we more have sort of itanium uh, war wounded in, our, in, in, in Intel research. <laughs> Actually, I'm only been in the company a year, so um, I, I sort of have still have this outsider headset, so I have to be careful what I say. Like sort of titanium, you know, uh, warriors in Intel, um, but not in Intel research proper. So left to right research pipeline, early going to late, you know. So if we talk about fuzzy idea to product on the right hand side, into uh, university grants and programs. So you know, shell out money as a research as a research organization to various labs um, to fund interesting stuff. Um, sort of at the next level of fuzziness, we have what I'm going to talk about today in great detail, the Intel Research uh, University Labs. Um, and there's four of these, and I'm going to talk about the Berkeley Lab in detail. That tries to, again, merge industry research as deeply as possible with uh, academic research, you know, rather than just sort of put an industry lab across the street from campus, that's it. You know, that's our integration, and that we're across the street. Uh, David tried to really sort of push that farther down. Then we've got um, this organization, this sort of weird thing, it's called the Strategic Research Project, and this is essentially like an ad hoc pickup organization. It's like a Hollywood film crew that gets built, an organization gets built to, to accomplish a specific project, and, and it gets disbanded after a time frame. So all these people are on a timer, usually two to three to four years. And the idea of these things is to take work from the universities and from the university labs. And then those are, in general, I'll talk about this more, open uh, uh, intellectual property to the published stuff. So the idea of the strategic research project is to harvest that, add Intel value, Intel like intellectual property, so this is generally sort of closed research, and then orient it toward a product division. So the idea is outside of this, it either gets fed directly to a product division or gets fed into one of these roadmap labs that are the vast majority of the, of the you know, Intel R&D. Um, and again, roadmap labs, these are labs that are sort of, again, leading the, the pipeline for any product that Intel has. And Intel doesn't do, just doesn't do processors. I mean, I get these emails every day about the price lists and things. And you know, Intel, it's, it, it does a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of these labs. And then lastly, Intel Capital, I think you all know, um, uh, tries to fund things sort of, I guess, sort of right near the product end cycle. And their goal is, again, to sort of advance the ecosystem. Um, Intel is all about ecosystems, right? So um, Intel tries to pull together, you know, um, various fellow travelers to try to increase market share for, for their components. So Intel is, in general, a component maker. And in order for it to succeed, it's got to have those components adapted in a larger system. So Intel Capital, I think, traditionally has been primarily concerned with establishing that ecosystem so that our components can pop into, right? 
Okay, so now the university labs in particular. What was the motivation for creating these? I'm sort of getting into David Tennant House's mind four years ago. So uh, he'll probably see this and, 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 uh, and yell at me, but uh, what the hell. Um, so the idea is to combine the best of both of these worlds. And I think, you know, we can sort of put these up out of our own head. There probably wouldn't be that much disagreement about sort of the goals, the strengths, and the challenges in university. University typically um, a long range horizon. Um, in an industry lab, you know, when there's product pressures um, or there's financial pressures, first thing that tends to happen is that research telescope tends to get pulled in. There's a knee jerk reaction, which is okay, we got to help differentiate our products and get some cool stuff in products so we can get revenue back. Um, typically, long range research in industry is always, in my mind, and I guess I said, Mark, I'm anxious to read your book, seems to be accompanied by really good financial performance. Um, so in the universities, in theory, you're supposed to be insulated from that. Um, also, with the students constantly moving through, new professors moving through, there's a constant sort of churn of ideas. So it's this sort of fresh environment. Something that I uh, notice at IBM, and you know, even on other industrial labs, is there has to be, I think, sort of a throughput. There has to be, um, you know, people leaving as well as people coming. You know, people just come and accumulate, and you know, it's great, but things tend to sort of stagnate, and universities tend to constantly refresh. So that's another interesting strength. Um, challenges for universities, they can only go so far in terms of scale and size of the things they attempt. Um, you know, you can get a multi-university, multi-institution grant, but it's a big challenge and it, you know, there's a, a handful of professors that want to tackle that thing. And even when you do, uh, the resources really can't compare to what a, a big uh, industrial lab can apply if it really wants to. So that's a limiting factor in the university. And also, students are great. There's nothing they can't do because they don't know it can't be done. So as we have all, you know, all our interns, they just they do amazing, great stuff. Um, but it's not necessarily something that you know, is going to be maintainable and is going to be buildable and you know, put out there in the world. And that's sort of a lack of engineering expertise, sort of how to build a hardened thing that you can like, that'll persist beyond the, uh, the, you know, the PhD. And then lastly, real world exposure, customer, customers, problems, you know, real people. Um, real situations. In some cases, it's actually hard for, um, for ac uh, academia to have access to, which is what companies have. On the other side, flip side of the coin, you know, Intel and in industries in general have a lot of te technology expertise, engineering expertise. Um, Intel, right, produces a lot of chips. Um, these are valuable to a lot of people in academia. Um, project, ma large project management can be Sounds boring, but when you want to sort of scale up a project, um, even if it's research, a lot of that is managing phones and scheduling meetings and all this, and you need to hire an admin, and you need to, you know, you need to make sure that things are progressing forward. And I think successful professors who can manage large projects have a sort of project management skill, even though you know if you told them that, they wouldn't want you to say that publicly. But I think there needs to be a certain amount of that, and, and typically Intel and large companies have that. And again, um, the challenges for Intel is, you know, in any industry lab, is that there's a tendency to sort of shrink that horizon to sort of focus on products, especially when there's any kind of risk. Um, and then, you know, our labor is a lot more expensive. Um, a fully burdened researcher at Intel, and probably in any lab, is at least three, four times maybe exp as expensive as you know, really smart, fluffy-tailed uh, graduate student. Um, and I'm not saying that we're exploiting the labor, but um, <coughs> it is a factor. So the idea is put those, the best of those two together, and how do you do it? So I'll spend a little bit of time on this chart here. Um, one thing you could do is, and I'm sure they thought of this, is, well, if you really want to integrate, you just hire a professor and have them run the lab. You know, let them do what they want. Um, OK, well, there's interesting problems with that. Do you want? A professor managing your company's employees. You know, my advisor was great, um, but the average professor, you know, you know, they're not motivated to have employee development and career management skills over the long term. It's a very different thing. So it's sort of a rare thing to find a professor with career development skills that can nurture um, a career of, of a permanent researcher. Um, it's just sort of not part of the culture. Not to say it doesn't exist. But that can be a problem. Um, the other thing is that you know I'm sure they're worried about is 
okay, you give the professors all these resources and money, access to this technology, you just open up the doors and, you know, and then they just go crazy and they do all sorts of wild and crazy stuff and then, you know, who's tracking these people? So there's a certain element of, you know, trust but verify here. So the idea is, you know, you do two in a box and um, that you have two directors, an academic director who's a professor at the university on a two-year assignment because, you know, they can't get more than that otherwise and, you know, then they lose their position. So um, that allows the, um, the professor to take the time that they're allotted by the university and you pair them with a intel director as a peer um, at the top of the organization and the intel director sort of works with the lab director to make sure the agenda doesn't go crazy. It has some relevance to Intel, but you know, is certainly wild enough that Intel wouldn't do it. Um, and that also can manage the careers of the um, uh, research staff. Uh, because if the professor can only take off two years to run this, which is the case for Berkeley, and I think it's probably, it's certainly probably the case for UC system, um, uh, then you know, everybody's manager changes every couple years. But if it's explicitly stated that your manager will change every two years, then people get a little kind of, who is my manager? Who will watch out for me? Um, so the academic, uh, the intel director sort of, you know, takes on that responsibility of continuity. Um, and we'll talk about that continuity and how directors change and how we handle that transition um, later on when I talk about how we're doing. So Joe Hellerstein is my uh, uh, partner in crime and I'm the, uh, the intel person. And then so you split it at the top and then you keep that split and you go all the way down because you're gonna sort of do a dual role of, that, uh, of an industry person, an academic person at the top, then you know, take the rest of the lab and you, and you split that up and you do a 50-50 mix. So the target, and these actually numbers were from a, a chart that was put up in, in, in September of 2001, two months after the Berkeley Lab was founded by David Culler, the, the founding dir academic director. And we're probably targeting, we're, we're, we're hitting pretty close to these numbers, which is a 50-50 mix, about 20 intel people, about 20 faculty, students. This varies depending, you know, summer interns, so it ebbs and flows. Um, but that idea of bringing the students and faculty in and rotating them around gives us a much more academic environment and gives that sort of throughput um, that I talked about earlier. It keeps the ideas fresh. So we've got this sort of split from the top all the way through the organization of this 50-50 split. And it's project focused and that's sort of a generic term, but what do I mean by that? Rather than have you know, N researchers and N projects, as one might get in, a, in an academic organization, right? Because it's all about a student getting a PhD. And in the end, they have to do original work on their own. So even if they're a part of a large grant, they're gonna have to go off and do their own individual thing because that's what you need to get a doctorate. Um, that's an academic thing, it's truly, I think, uh, the idea of these labs is to sort of scale up what, it, what, it, what an academic lab could do. So we try to get projects where there's multiple resources. You know, K projects and N researchers where K is some you know, uh, smaller number than N. Um, the projects horizon about six years and the idea is to start these about every two years. And you'll see later on the status, I think we're, we're starting a few. Um, we started a few too many. Um, and then lastly, um, the research is conducted in an open environment, meaning it's not closed, it's not proprietary. Um, the professors don't come in and sign away their rights uh, to Intel when they come in and work at the lab, nor do the students. Um, and the, um, and this is sort of critical because we won't be able to get students to stay with us very long. You know, uh, we can get a student for an internship if they're working on a proprietary thing. Um, that's not a big deal get a good line on their resume. But if they want, if you want that person in that lab for maybe three years out of their uh, PhD, um, the work that they do with that lab has to be open. Ditto for the professor. So this is critical um, that we're in an open environment and that makes us much more academic than any of the Intel labs, which is an interesting tension point uh, between us. Because um, again, that's sort of the key barrier to collaboration. Um, uh, the UC, I think the Berkeley campus, I'm pretty sure the UC system, um, some of you wouldn't, might know better than I, but if you actually step one toe onto the Berkeley property, anything that you think of or create is owned by the University of California at Berkeley. Now, I don't know if that's a, that's a barrier, that's a serious barrier to industry academia collaboration. On the other side, you know, 
Intel won't even let you in the door. You know, you have to have a badge. You have, there's a security guard there. You can't get out. Of, you can't get past the lobby. So you know, that's sort of the, that's the natural state of industry research and academic research right now, uh, and that obviously is a barrier to free flow of people and ideas. So so this is critical, um, and so it deserves sort of a another chart. And I, I apologize. This is sort of the most boring chart, but probably the most critical. Yeah. You share? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Great lead in. Um, so there was a two-year effort to get a legal framework, an IP framework, for this collaboration between Intel and Berkeley. And the nice thing about this is that, you know, Berkeley, Intel's had a very long relationship with Berkeley. You know, it's like multiple uh, decades, 25 years of uh, funding projects and being, you know, campus sponsors. and very deep, close ties with the faculty. So this was possible, I think, because of that long relationship. But even so, two years to, orga to, to negotiate with the lawyers at the highest levels of both the VP of Research, the uh, Vice Chancellor of Research, and the Office of the President in, in, at Berkeley. And um, it's essentially a two-part document. Uh, this is a public document, by the way, because it's negotiated with the public organization, so anybody can, can get at this. Um, I think it's available if you just go to Google Intel Research. Um, but if not, you can Google me, and I can email you a copy. Um, but there's two parts to this. There's the big sort of massive template, which sets the overall terms and IP structure. And so I'll touch on that. And then there's a, a for each project that we do in the lab, joint with the university, there's a smaller addendum, um, which basically scopes out an individual project and defines the IP sort of boundaries around that project. So I'll do a little more detail on this. The master agreement, the goal of this master agreement, if you take all the legalese and boil it down, is that the idea of all the work that happens in the lab is um, to be open and publishable as fast as possible. And patents aren't disallowed or prevented, uh, but the idea is that they're the rare thing. Okay? And when they're rare, if they do occur, then the UC has the option of owning those, has first choice at that. But everyone who signs on to this agreement, and UC and Intel are sort of default the two signers, but in fact, other signers, um, oops, oops, I forgot to add that bullet. There's a missing bullet. Other companies and institutions can in fact sign on to that agreement, and many have, and I'll talk about the details when we get to the projects. But anyone who signs that master agreement for a particular project gets uh, a perpetual, um, royalty-free, non-revocable license to the, uh, the IP. But the university retains the rights to sort of license that and outside uh, the people that sign the, um, the, the document. I'm trying desperately to avoid use of acronyms. Um, <laughs> all these documents have acronyms. So. Um, so the goals of that, um, again, sort of this limit reach through on each side. So there's other legal mechanisms in there. The universities, you know, hair stands up in the back of its neck when it talks about an industry coming in and affecting academic freedom. So you want free and unfettered, you know, um, ac uh, research. You don't, want it, you don't want any undue influence through money or any other coercive means to subvert academic freedom. So there are mechanisms there to do that. And conversely, Intel has mechanisms in there to prevent reach through into Intel's um, patent portfolio. So they don't want their stuff that's already um, protected and confidential to be leaked through these relationships. So there's sort of, what there are is there's fences built that sort of define you know, things that, that Intel is not allowed to do and the signer is not allowed to do um, to both sides. So essentially a lot of these provisos that prevent that sort of reach through. And that probably was the sort of the longest part of the negotiation. I wasn't around, thank God. Um, and again, there, there it is, I didn't miss the bullet. Yeah, so third parties can sign on. So an example of this is in the sensor net research, which I'm gonna talk about in detail as, a, as an example, um, a company, a startup company called Crossbow in San Jose uh, manufactures some of the designs that came out of Berkeley and Intel. Um, and so they're a signer onto this um, agreement. So they essentially get that royalty-free license for this technology. Okay, um, and the way the individual document works is essentially it just lists people, which is the critical thing, and it lists a description of the, pro uh, of the work. 
And so essentially, everything outside that description, if you think of that as a fence that defines a set of people and a project, uh, that's a fence. Everything inside that fence goes in this agreement. Uh, everything outside that fence is standard, you know, UC, touch your foot on the, the property, it's owned by UC, blah, blah, blah. Okay? The, uh, and, and, and this is, um, again, it calls out some exceptions. If one of these projects pushes close to, say, Intel, Intel intellectual property, let's say CPU architecture, which would be problematic, then there would be a whole additional list of things that you can and can't do in there. But we try to avoid um, that stuff that's close to Intel products. We try to stay off the roadmap. So that's another factor that helps here, too. And then these things don't take two years to approve. So that took two years to approve the, the, the main one. And then these things, basically, there's a committee on both sides get signed like that. So you can essentially create these as needed as project starts. So I'll send the sort of my view of the legalese. Anyway, the goal of, the, of this and, and what this does is it allows you know, people from Intel to walk across campus and work and, and allows people from the, the campus to come back into the lab. And in fact, the, you know, this essentially opened the gates to just free flow of people back and forth with no fear of the lawyers coming down five years from now and shooting everybody. <laughs> All right, so uh, last slide on this sort of high level stuff. So the value proposition, if I put my marketing hat on, what does Intel get out of this? Intel gets this blue sky, long horizon, off the road map place where crazy stuff happens. They're looking for these high risk, um, but high impact if they hit areas. They're looking for game changers, all right? Um, and also, even if none of the research that happens at, our, at these university labs takes off, at least they have a real close connection with the university that they didn't have before. They have eyes and ears, so they can maybe anticipate sea changes before they occur. You know, oops, the internet. Um, so that's what Intel gets in the university, as I said before, gets the scale up, gets access. A professor or faculty member says, you know what? I could actually take this to the next level using you know, additional people, additional money, additional projects, et cetera. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So again, there's this permeable membrane which this structure achieves. Um, in order to integrate, you really have to integrate the people. It all comes down to people. And you have to eliminate all the barriers to people physically, um, legally, and, and organizationally to interacting. And essentially, that's actually worked really well. OK, so there's four of these labs. Berkeley was the first, um, and Seattle was the second, Gaetano. Um, Satya was third at, Cam at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, uh, Matt McCauley in the University of Cambridge. Um, these three labs, I think, have crossed, certainly have crossed their two-year anniversary. Max hasn't, so we've actually transitioned academic directors. Um, so now Joe Hellerstein is in the slot at Berkeley. Todd Maori just took over Carnegie Mellon, and James Landay, who was at Berkeley, but moved to UW, um, and then he took the Seattle lab as well. And Mac is still anxiously recruiting his replacement, which is an interesting thing. Um, all, these, all these people have to come in and almost immediately start recruiting their replacements as they, as they arrive. Um, what, I, what, I, what I should say here is um, I didn't put co-directors. I'm the first uh, co-director, and uh, there are essentially no other co-directors in the other three labs. They're searching for these positions, and I can talk about uh, that is a problem. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess, apparently very unique. I don't know if it's a bug or a feature. Um, another interesting thing, actually, is the founding directors, and I'll talk about this later, um, because you know, they're starting from a clean slate. Um, the founding directors had a unique position. They could really stamp their personal style onto the labs. And each lab is still, in some sense, reverberating from the personal style of its uh, founding director. And uh, um, uh, Color, interestingly enough, uh, Color has an amazing track record in systems research. You know, I mean, you know, he's hit a lot of home runs, and he's an amazing, high-energy guy. He's actually frightening in his energy. Um, but he pinned me down like within two days of my arriving, and like fire hosed me with everything that needed to be done. Um, I was like, just got here. Um, but, the, but, his, but another interesting thing about David is that he's very 
um, I think, aware of the physical environment and its impact on, on people around, around them. And he's very detail-oriented in that. So when he put the plan, the floor plan for Berkeley together, it's an amazing job, and it works amazingly well. It's probably the best sort of physical environment, I think, in Intel, which is a low bar, but, um, but, 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 he, but it's, it's a really nice place. And, and uh, um, there's a story where you know, he's touring you know, some Intel suits through the lab, and it's got uh, carpet that's not Intel gray, uh, regulation Intel gray, and there's a lot of grumbling. And he had to point out to them that you know, green is the same price as gray. You know, it's just a different color, just the same price. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll skip the story about the fountain and the totem pole, maybe save that for later if we have time. Uh, okay, so now Berkeley specifically, as we sort of near the end of the first half of the talk, um, we're, I think, three years old as of uh, last August or September. Um, if you get off the downtown Berkeley BART stop, um, we are right there in the Power Bar building and we have the penthouse. And we got that, I think the lease was signed in 2001. So we are paying pre-bust rent for that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite a big expense. Um, again, we have two. Here's just a sort of a list of the bodies that we have. Two directors, three support, ops person, admin, and IT. Right now, we've got three visiting faculty. I'll talk more about how we use that visiting faculty slot. We have 13 um, Intel people that are uh, researchers and postdoc. Um, and we've got, right now, anywhere, right now we've got five interns. In the summer, we have about 16. Um, and then we just have students, some professors that we're working with on campus, um, and also off, off the UC campus, we, we work with other universities as well, who just have their offices in our, in our lab rather than at the, uh, in Soda Hall. So we range around 30 to 50 bodies, and that's pretty good for Goodwill. We have about 10,000 square feet projects. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. I'm gonna take the first two projects and, and talk a little bit about more of them later on. And I won't talk about these. I just want to sort of show you the sort of context of the number of projects that happen and how it evolves. Um, so if you look at um, you know, September 01, when the lab was founded, till sort of September 03, when there was an academic director transition. And then I came in shortly after that. Um, you can see a little bit of adjustment here. So here's where you know, founding director clean slate, you know, this, this was empty. And he essentially, David, established SensorNets, Planet Lab, this sort of holding pattern for a, a number of HCI uh, projects. And then one of the researchers just did this on his own and essentially became its own project. Um, so David started these two. Um, this is sort of, you know, uh, ill-defined project as sort of a holding. And then this uh, was started on its own. What Joe and I saw, you know, in conjunction with David's help, is that, um, and I'll talk about this, this plant lab, we sort of ramped down, sort of came to a completion, but the people on it and the concepts and the results actually could fork into two new areas. So we sort of started two new projects there. Same with the HCI work. Um, that had come to a conclusion and we forked them into two new areas. So it's less of a 90 degree turn in our agenda. We looked at what we had, some research results were available. Some of these projects were sunsetted. We looked at the skills of the people. We looked at what Joe and I wanted to do, because I actually, um, one of these is mine, uh, the digital home. And um, we sort of, we're turning a battleship here, or moving a big grand piano, whereas David got to build it, you know. Uh, Culler got to build it, the founding director. We, at this point, can sort of just make a nice steer. We're not gonna turn it 90 degrees, but we're gonna adjust it by 20, 30, 40 degrees. Rock turning, a good question. So while it's important to be, like I said, project oriented, to sort of have more oomph in than an academic, you know, K projects, K researchers environment, um, you don't want to set, force everyone to work on the big project, right? If somebody has a crazy idea, you know, we are about off the road in that research, we're about crazy ideas. You need to have, you know, a certain level of activity of that going on at all times. I think all the lab directors talk about this a lot, and we say somewhere between 10 and 20% of our resources, and that's sort of money and headcount dollars on rock turning. We feel it's sort of a nice number. Right now, we're a little low. Um, that's gonna shift around, I think, at next year and bring that up again. Um, but that's sort of that. You want 
those rock turning things to happen, researchers just going off, following their instincts, and saying, you know, is that an interesting result, interesting result, maybe a paper here, maybe a paper not. And then you look at that and you think, can this be expanded? Can we, can we, can we hit a bigger target with this thing? Or, or not just sort of shut it down. So there's always an element of that. Yeah. And then you mesh with uh, thesis endings. Mm. Good question. Um, there's no, we're still early enough that there, are, there isn't, I think, a consistent answer to that. Um, and generally, it's sort of decoupled, I'd say. Um, there are students that help on big projects. Say, for example, let's take CentraNets. It's one of the ones we have the most data for because it was the largest and oldest. Um, there are a number of students that helped with the CentraNet effort. It was a very big effort. And essentially, each of their theses um, filled some gap in the larger picture of CentraNets. So in some sense, they're sort of, uh, you know, blissfully independent of our larger project agenda. Um, so they're reasonably decoupled. So they drop off, you know, as they get their degree. And, and sometimes we hire them in po as postdocs. In CentraNets, we took a postdoc um, actually for a year before he went off to be faculty at MIT. Um, so uh, there isn't really a correlation, I'd say, based on our CentraNet experience. Okay. All right, so what's the status? I um, guess I'm running a little late, sorry about that. Um, but that's good, we have a lot of interaction. Um, so high order bits. I'll be, I'll be uh, you know, immodest and say I think we've got a huge lab. So let me do a little uh, instant, insta poll here. Um, you know, how many of you have heard about the Berkeley Lab before this, this, this talk? Okay, so that's good. How many of you have heard of the you know, Berkeley Lab associated with sensor nets? Okay, that's good. And how many have heard of Planet Lab? Okay, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. Um, you know, my mom noticed us because you know we were on uh, we were in the, the Economist or something, or, 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 or Time Magazine, or Forbes, or so. You know, we're not getting, I think, more press if you look at the press and the, and the publication counts than any other lar than any other organization. But Joe Hellstein has a theory that the press has an appetite for about k new things from any company, and we have just about K. <laughs> so each one of these, our marketing people in research, we have our own marketing arm, they just flog the press. You know, if I'm IBM Research or you know, Park or a large organization, you know, I've got 100 items, you know. So um, I'm gonna sort of spread my marketing dollars. So you know, we feel like you know, everything we do gets this great exposure. Um, that might be just a function of the fact that there's this Hellerstein law applying. Um, but from my perspective of being at, at IBM Research and sort of watching other uh, research uh, labs in terms of productivity, paper counts, and et cetera, um, for the size that we are, for the cost that we are, it's extremely cheap. And for as young as we are, you know, the, the average experience of the researchers that, that uh, we have in the lab, very low, amazing impact. Um, so, you know, by ever how you, however you measure it. So um, in three years, I think it's been amazing. Um, and the campus loves us. We have these biannual advisory board love fests where you know, they just love to trot people through our lab. Every visiting dignitary that comes to visit EECS you know, takes a detour through our lab and we do glad handing and you know, picture taking and things like that. Um, so we do our, you know, our bit for them. Um, the work environment, as uh, one of our people said, when I interviewed for the job, the biggest fear of the, of the researchers was it was so good it had to end, you know? And so they were like, how can we, you know, prevent this from being crushed because it's, it's so good that, you know, it'll never be uh, true. Um, so far, we're not crushed. Um, director of Transitions, I'll talk about that. I'll have a slide on that. Uh, so far, so good. Um, our tech transfer story, we're only three years, um, and it's yet to play out, but I will have some early indicators on, uh, on a, a one detail slide later. Okay, so I'm gonna take two um, projects, two of our most mature projects, and just say a little bit about them, how they um, illustrated some of this whole process. Um, the first is CentraNets, which is the oldest. And uh, for those of you who don't know, just a quick thing, sensors uh, and, center and networks of sensors are basically, you know, sort of the, the end game of miniaturization. You know, you take a processor, you take a flash, you take memory, and you add a battery to it, you add a radio to it, and you make it the size of your, you know, fingernail or smaller. 
Um, and then you scatter these things around. You make millions of them. You scatter them in the environment. And then they, are, you know, they can communicate with each other through mesh networking and pass data back and forth. Uh, sorry, and the key thing is they have sensors built into them that sense light, heat, vibration, um, cameras. Um, so basically, they're sort of eyes and ears. And it's sort of you know, Weiser's vision of computing disappearing into the fabric really is the fabric. You know, these things are just scattered around. So um, we're, along with the campus, um, sort of leaders in the sort of design of the hardware, um, the boards, the sensor designs, um, the, uh, the open source um, operating system for this, which is a lightweight operating system that deals with power issues. Because it's all about keeping that battery alive as long as possible. Um, and if you run an embedded Linux on this thing, you know, it's not the, it's not the best thing for battery life. Um, and there's also a version of a, a SQL database that we've pushed into the network. Um, and we've deployed these things everywhere. And the oil tanker is a BP oil tanker um, that's flying the North Sea. One of our researchers who's ex-Navy um, and a SensorNet guy is going there and uh, monitoring all the vibrating equipment on the, on the tanker um, and taking readings of it. Um, so that's a sort of a machinery vibration application that's one of the big vertical markets for sensors. Um, and then, so the way this worked out really well, this is a very successful product, you'll probably read about this in a lot of the press, is that there's this sort of virtual cycle of, of, of credibility. Um, the campus did great work, but then to have Intel, a big fab, come up and say, you know what, this is something we're putting our name against our, you know, we're getting involved and we're spending money, this sort of lends a certain kind of validity to the sort of crazy work, you know. Um, and conversely, Intel gets sort of the credibility of the research that was developed through the campus. So it was a very sort of nice virtuous cycle of credibility on both sides. Um, and as a result, I think Intel and UCB both recognize as leaders this, uh, sorry, an acronym leaked in. Strategic research projects, these are the things I mentioned before that are a tech transfer vehicle like the Hollywood film to take and harvest um, university lab research and push it into a product division. Three of these were started to build intellectual property on top of the open source um, and public uh, information about the uh, uh, SensorNet hardware. By the way, you know, if you just Google TinyOS and TinyDB, Tiny you'll find everything you want to know about all that stuff. So iMoat is essentially an Intel proprietary version of a moat, plus the i. Um, heterogeneous sensor nets, typically the academic community was talking about a sort of a flat network space for all these, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Um, and you know, a group in Oregon said, you know what, maybe we need more of a hierarchical approach with gateways and you know, maybe they're powered, plugged into the wall, maybe there's 802.11 intermixed with the proprietary you know, uh, 900 megahertz radios that these things are using. That actually turned out to be really good and fed back into the research community. Um, and so there's a lot of cool stuff that was added here uh, from an intellectual property standpoint. And there's another thing, uh, SRP, that sort of took these and said, how do we attack a market vertical? And they went after this sort of, um, is it environmental sensing? I got that wrong. It's, it's economic sensing is what that was. Um, EchoSense was the name. Everybody was a bit confused. But those are the people that develop the techniques that we've deployed on the, on the, on the ship. Yeah. So researchers at the lab uh, sort of greatly encouraged to become involved in these strategic projects, or, or do they just stay at the lab? Do they feed back into the corporation somehow? That's a good question. The strategic research projects have to have a research sponsor and a roadmap lab sponsor. So they have to be housed in order to be approved and given money for the PEDs. They range anywhere, any, range anywhere from eight to, you know, three to eight or 10 max heads, head count. Um, but in order for that head count to be authorized and released, there has to be somebody in research that says, this is a good idea. And there has to be an owner in one of these roadmap labs that owns it. So the teams essentially are mixed. So like, for example, one of our roadmap labs is a communications technology lab that is the, feeds the pipe for our communications you know, products. Um, so that lab said, you know, this sensor net stuff is pretty cool. We'll authorize this. We'll chip in some headcount. And then we as research say, OK, we'll chip in these people. So it's a joint mix. Now, on this one, 
you know, that mix wasn't without its tension, you know, because it's sort of a Intel mindset about how to do things and a sort of a crazy Berkeley mindset. Um, so I won't say that that was sort of an easy mix. Um, but the headcount essentially came from the corporation, came from research, and the idea is they work together, they develop the IP, and they sort of then spin out that. Um, sometimes Intel researchers go downstream. Um, in other cases, which may happen here, um, but usually they're on a rubber band back. Um, so the tech transfer, this gets into the tech transfer. Um, this stuff is sort of ready to try to ha be hardened and try to get some market data. Problem is, there really isn't an Intel product division that makes sensors today. So we have the same problem, you know, that many other labs would do just coming up with sort of a game-changing product. You know, you knock on these doors and they go, yeah, it's infinite. Yeah, that's cool. I read about that in the paper. I'm busy here. You know. So what we're doing is we're sort of creating this weird hybrid organization. It's, a, it's an ad tech an ad, ad advanced development organization at the mix of all these people that were internal on the roadmap labs, um, that were on the um, research side, and we're gonna sort of take it to the next step. And the idea is that's another timed organization that we're actually gonna go out and sell this our own, ourselves, get money from real customers. BP wants, is desperate to, to pay money for us to, to outfit their entire fleet with this. We're not ready, you know. There's nobody that can handle calls from BP 24 hours a day, we're a research organization. And in fact, we're gonna build a prototype business unit for this and get some money, and if it works out well, we either get a real P&L unit in, in Intel to take it on, or we just flush it down. Because I mean, you can only beat on those doors for so long. You know? So, but I think this one looks good for a transfer. It's a logical step for Intel to move into. And another sort of example of this is where uh, Planet Lab, again, um, for those of you who haven't heard about it, it's basically a, a, a planetary test bed for di distributed systems research and development. All right, so before Planet Lab, um, if you wanted to test out a new distributed system, you called up 10 of your friends in universities and you said, can I borrow your machines? And you put their code on and you know, overnight you did your test and that was it. And it sort of didn't really scale beyond that. Um, so Planet Lab is actually a sort of a permanent test bed that scales into the hundreds of nodes uh, around 200 sites around the world. And so that's the map I think that I just pulled yesterday of the current nodes location. So this really did change the face of distributed systems research. If you look at you know, uh, um, uh, some of the major uh, operating systems, distributed systems conferences, you know, the number of people that use Planet Lab is you know, becoming the majority of the conferences now. In fact, it's getting to the point where one of our researchers that developed this is gonna write a paper that said Planet Lab considered harmful. So it'll be interesting to see what he says about that. Um, but this one um, is another case where, you know, you had a bunch of people in the university that said, you know, what if we built this distributed systems test bed? Um, how, do we, how do we put this out onto 400, you know, locations and 200 sites? Uh, Intel can provide that kind of scale. So that's what Intel brought to the table here. And it really worked really well. Um, that one kind of, we transferred to an industry consortium, which is a nonprofit thing. You can look at the Planet Lab website and see. Essentially, Intel pushed that into the ecosystem. Um, that's not to say that Intel can't make a product out of this. Um, there are people looking at that. But it's not something that was done, you know, at the beginning with an eye toward an Intel product line or some silicon. So there's no clear silicon play here. But in general, this is considered a great success because it's seeded the ecosystem. Okay, last couple slides, um, director transitions. So there's this concern that as directors come in, um, you know, what do they do? Is there gonna be some sort of big shift? Is there gonna be a sort of an earthquake in the organization in terms of the agenda, in terms of the way the people are managed? How do you, how do you manage these transitions so they're smooth? So we have a couple tools. One is me, um, the Intel director, uh, or the co-director, right? So I'm there to provide some continuity across these directors. So that's one key thing. The other is we have this visiting faculty thing. So we essentially pay consulting money to a professor. And we use this to bring in candidates a year early who we think might be academic director candidates. This was done with Joe Hellerstein. We're doing this with a couple candidates already that we think might be future academic director. Um, so that gets them involved in some of the research. Obviously there has to be a match with the agenda of the lab. 
Um, so we have two of these people in. Um, and that gets them used to the people, gets the people used to them. You know, sort of it's sort of like a, a year try and buy kind of thing, try before you buy. Then if we, uh, then the academic director transition happens, they can hit the ground running. They've got two years to sort of execute on the agenda. Uh, but they've actually already had one year working on the research project. And Joe Hellerstein is a good prime example. David Culler pulled him in on Sentinets and pulled him in on Planet Lab and then brought him in as a visiting faculty member. So he was involved in all the projects, the major projects, and he had an idea of how to translate those into his own agenda. And the people in the lab were familiar with it. And then, right now, David Culler is still in the lab every day. He's on visiting faculty as Director Emeritus. And Joe will also be Director Emeritus. So essentially it's like a year or 18 months on visiting faculty before, two year assignment, and then sort of the Emeritus Directorship one to two years after. So it's really kind of a four, six year you know, thing. So we sort of tweak the system uh, a bit. So that actually gives them a lot more kind of time to, to do this, uh, to execute their um, agenda. The problem here is nobody can hire the co-director. Um, it took them about nine months to fill my position. And I think they, they had this holy grail idea that that the co-director had to be somebody that could compete with all the researchers in terms of publication record and you know, stellar research star, but also had to be an Intel insider and know all about the company so could have these connections, so a senior Intel person. And it had to be somebody who could manage the careers of these people and that everybody would like, and somebody who would, you know, live in Berkeley. You know, the, the intersection of all of those is pretty empty. Um, and they didn't get that in me, you know, because my research record is, you know, I mean, not that stellar. I mean, I think I did good work, but it's not a high volume thing. I spent a lot of time in industry. So essentially the lab just ignored the advice of the, uh, David Tenenhaus and said, you know, we like this guy, we're bringing him in. And Joe said, I'm quitting if I don't get a co-director. And essentially all the other lab directors, academic directors are facing the same situation. There is nobody that fits this kind of perfect co-director role. You're gonna get one or the other, you know. Um, so that's been a problem. And Berkeley being Berkeley, we just ignore because we know best and we just did it. And the other labs are kind of not that Berkeley attitude. They're more nice, you know, and they're trying to play by the rules. And we're telling them, you know, just don't play by the rules. Just hire who you want. Um, and I think I said this before, each lab, each of these four labs have very distinct personalities. And again, I, I'll, I'll, tell the, I'll tell the fountain story later. Um, so there's another concern here is that as the head count in the lab ramps up, we only have so many head counts, so many people we can fit in that room, in that space at each lab. Um, we only have so many projects that can be in the pipeline. You know, as David Culler had free reign, he had all the levers to pull. But as it ramps down, each director gets sort of fewer and fewer levers to pull. So there's a lot of interesting thoughts there and we're sort of too early to tell, but it's something we talk about a lot. How does a new director actually have levers to, to turn? Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to handle that. Uh, last, uh, yeah, last but not least, tech transfer. It's still like pulling teeth. Um, this, I, you know, I would love to just spend, a, 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 you know, five years studying, the, you know, the park um, because there's probably enough um, tech transfer examples here to sort of satisfy any researcher, um, but. So I won't be able to tell you guys anything new. It's still like pulling teeth. Everything, you know, with our university model is true with us as it is with anything else. If you're on the roadmap and you have a product division and an established market and you're doing an epsilon delta to a product, bingo. You've got a champion. You know, you find that key engineer who says, you know, we're doing that for version X. And it goes in, you get the awards, and everybody's a hero, you know? But it's epsilon delta. It's not, it's not a game changer. If you have a game changer, I don't need to tell Park about that. Um, bank shots, bank shots. Another example of you know, the classic case of, of taking your research and hockey pucking it outside of the company into another company, all right? And the classic example I like because I'm an IBMer, an old IBMer, is relational databases, right? Ted Codd wrote these great papers, and everybody said, you know, what's that? Looks very mathematical, I don't get it. We already have databases, what's he doing? He's this crazy old crank. And Larry Ellison read those papers and goes, wow, this is cool, let's build it. And then IBM woke up and said, wait a minute, what's this Oracle thing? And you know, bingo, so they started doing it. So I call that a bang shot. And we're doing that a little bit in Sentinets as well, 
with this ICAMP investment in, in Prospo down here in San Jose. So we gave them the goods and they're hockey, hockey sticking, you know, their revenues and they're doing great. So they're sort of seeding the market and, and getting a little bit of data point for Intel so they're more comfortable at adopting the technology that actually came from inside Intel. What is different is that um, there's always a culture gap between researchers and, and, and developers. You know, developers are like crazy researchers. They think it's a great idea, but you know, the code sucks and you know, these guys are nuts. What we're doing is we're taking that left side and we're even stretching it further. So it's not like in-house researchers. It's like professors and students at the university, you know, and they're just crazy. So that, that culture gap actually is exacerbated and we're feeling some of those effects. I think that's the key difference, but it's a subtle difference. The general pitch is that we're, we're no better or worse than any other model for tech transfer. And I think, last slide, is the model replicable? I get people touring through the lab all the time. Companies just constantly coming in, what's the model? How do you do this? This is great, we hear a lot about it. I tell them about the open collaborative agreement, about open IP, and the eyeballs pop out, the jaws drop, and they go silent. And that's it, we don't hear from them again. This to me is a key barrier. And I think if I look at Intel, you know, management structure that I talked about, two in a box, 50-50, you know, if you get the IP stuff agreed and you get sort of this open collaborative model, that stuff is easy. But Intel has, I think, an interesting position with respect to the open collaborative model. It's a component supplier. So it, it's much easier for its boat to float if there's a new ecosystem that's, that's created. Even say sensor nets. If Intel never makes a sensor, because it determines that say the price points are too low or margins are too low or whatever. They're gonna like give it to TI or Samsung. Um, they still are envisioning a world where there's all this data pouring out from billions of sensors. You know, where's it gonna go? It's gotta be processed. It'll be processed in an Intel processor, you know. Great. Um, there's other companies, other companies don't necessarily have that position. And lastly, we, I think we have a grace period so far. We're getting great press. Intel research is new. Berkeley Lab is new, and so Intel, I think, is like, oh, this is a new baby. We're the first baby. They've never really had this before. So it's like, this is, babies are cool. Um, you know, this, we get a lot of great press, um, and these, these guys are cool. But I think, you know, another couple of years, there'll be a five-year mark, and people say, okay, what's the ROI? What's the bang for the buck? So I think it's still a little early to talk about us because we're in this um, grace, you know, this honeymoon. Um, but a good sign is that when the Intel University Labs were built, Intel was going through its harshest financial time in its history. And the labs were built and the money was committed. So that's a good sign of commitment. But we do, long run, I think every industrial research lab needs a home run. You know, so that they can point back and say, you know, that thing created X billion dollars in revenue. Therefore, we paid for the next 10, 20 years. Right? And I think we need that just like anyone else does. Okay, so conclusion. It's a great experiment, actually. It was a very, it's a privilege for me to be part of it, sort of learn while it's going, and hopefully I was able to sort of clue you in on some of this stuff. Um, but interestingly enough, I have to say this, all this process and stuff, um, we actually haven't discussed the real reason for success. Um, you can set up the best process in the world. You can set up the best legal framework in the world. You can set up the best working environment in the world. But if you don't hire the right people, it's not gonna spark. Right, so I just want to close on the fact that you know my management philosophy is we get the right set of people, and this is our this is our crew. Mine has a couple of people on vacation. Um, you know, lots of things can be overcome. Uh, so if you get the wrong people, you know the best process isn't going to save you. So just want to close on that. So that's all I have. projects, I think one of them was public health. Could you give a brief comment on those? Mm -hmm. So uh, public okay. health for the internet and open DHT. Open DHT is a small project actually, uh, distributed hash table. One of our researchers, a couple of our researchers noticed that, you know, there's a lot of these things in academic papers that are published for, you know, a paper deadline and then disappear or a thesis and disappear. So the issue is actually of taking and making that a publicly available service. And in fact, there's a lot of interesting issues about resource allocation and, and privacy and resiliency. And so that is essentially part of the reason why it came out of Planet Lab is because a sort of a distributed memory DHT service was, you know, desirable, 
for the, you know, they looked at all of them. They looked at bamboo, they looked at cord and all these things. They said, you know, they, these actually don't fly in the real world. So that was one branch that said, what if we actually did a public service? So you can look that up, I think. On, I think it used to be called Open Hash, but then our lawyers canned it. So now it's called Open DHT. I think it's, it's reasonably public. There are people using it. Um, and then the second branch is, uh, we knew Planet Lab was a success when it got, uh, when it was hacked. Um, you know, so here, you know, this is great honeypot of 400 machines, you know, unattended across the world. And, uh, you know, it, it, it got hacked bad and, and came down. So there's, so that, so there's, you know, I think the designers are always were sort of, you know, knowing that this could happen and, and putting off some of these issues. Um, and I think that sort of is the genesis of how do you, how do you take, um, how do you take preventative action and what's an approach to sort of deal with internet safety or the health of the internet? So uh, this is Joe Hellerstein's project. And he essentially took a lot of the Planet Lab people and they just sort of shifted into this new organization which is trying to take an epidemiological approach to um, viruses and epidemics rather than the current approach which is sort of more medicine approach. Inoculate one machine, inoculate, you inoculate, sort of a doctor uh, approach. So he's taking a sort of epidemic, epidemiological approach to this, and it does take a lot of the plants, the learnings from Planet Lab, and takes the skills and the same people um, and distribute the systems, and they're gonna try to actually build um, some interesting things, um, and there's like about seven different facets of that. I can go into more detail on that if you want. I have a question. So four lab lists are good. Why not, if they're being successful, why not more? Or what, what stops it? Yeah. Um, well, headcount budgets, of course. Uh, but assuming infinite headcount budget, um, we had this discussion not too long ago. Um, you know, where, where do you want to put these things? And uh, the nice thing about Intel research being small is reasonably nimble. And so we had to make a decision about just the overall organization size. And that incurs communication overheads and additional management layers. So there's that. The second thing is, um, you know, what are the re personal and real relationship that Intel has with, with various universities. And that sort of limits the set as well. And then, uh, and lastly, is there sort of an agenda at those, those departments um, that sort of uh, correspond to sort of things that Intel is interested in? And right now, we have a couple interesting candidates, um, but not all the pieces are there. And I think you'll see more. There is, um, I think you saw in Israel, we don't have a specific uh, university in, is in Israel yet where there's a physical lab. But we have the sort of beginnings of that where we've got a, what we call a sector director who's essentially doling out cash and trying to, to coalesce, um, connect uh, the, in, uh, the Israeli universities with the, uh, with the developers and researchers in Israel. So I think you'll see you know, the constellation forming for a planet or the dust forming for a planet in Israel is one case. Um, but right now, I think we have sort of organizational size growth constraints decided against um, growing. We want to sort of harvest the existing labs more. So for example, at Berkeley, we're working really well with the CS division of EECS. Not so well with the EE side. And in fact, there's other you know, organizations we could work with, um, the architecture department. My project, Digital Home, you know, there's some great people in Berkeley in the architecture department. So we think we want to sort of make sure we harvest what we can and learn what we can with these labs before we extend ourselves beyond it. We're just sort of a little young yet to take that step. That was sort of our, our group consensus. Is it one question? Did the budget come down? 